Hello, welcome. We are Red Sage Stories. I'd like to tell you a little bit about us and what we do. Red Sage Stories was formed in 2017. We got a grant from NIFA, Creative City Grant, and it was called The Welcome Table, where we invited people to come in and sit down, have a cup of tea, and tell us whether they felt welcome or not welcome in their neighborhood. We did this at the Strand Lobby, at the Nightingale Garden, at DSNI, and at the Dudley Cafe. We listened to all kinds of stories, and then we came up with a play from those stories that we called The Bus. And we presented that to over 600 people. And after we, or even during that process, the people in the company were invited to continue training and performing. And we performed for our neighborhood based in Dorchester and Roxbury. And we found that we were filling a very important niche. One that was filled by a company, predominantly POC, uh, interracial, intergenerational, multi-language. And we got great responses. So we continued. What do we do? We do something called playback theater that was formed in the 70s by a couple, Jonathan Fox and Joe Salas. It's improvisational theater. It's spontaneous. We invite people in the audience to tell their stories, true personal stories. And then we, the actors, immediately dramatize those stories. We try to get to the heart of the story. And spontaneity is very important. And here in COVID-19 reality, sponta spontaneity is a challenge. Like, how do we do this work on the screen? How do we do it, each person from their house, and not being able to look at each other and touch each other, which we normally do? Uh, we're usually right up there creating sculptures and forms and we can't do that now. If we speak on top of each other, it sounds terrible. And we can't really vibe each other the way we used to. So we're finding new forms, which is really exciting. And sometimes it really works. And we're thinking, hey, we're going to stick with this. And sometimes we're longing for the old way. And we feel sad that we can't do that. So what we're going to do tonight is a new form of playback theater. And we're very excited to use it to illuminate quotes from the research that was done that's being presented at the Arts Equity Summit 2020. We chose a few of those quotes that resonated with us, and we're going to present some stories and respond to them spontaneously, which means we haven't scripted our reactions. What you'll see is fresh, but you'll be able to watch it a few times. We hope you enjoy it. So the first question is, what do you think of when you hear equity in the arts? Let's watch. When I think of equity in the arts, I think of strength. Let's watch. <sighs> My words, has, they have power. Get on board. Lifting it up. Hi, 
My name is Maria, and when I think of equity in the arts, I think of being able to create and perform in a space that is free of misogyny and racism. Let's watch. <laughs> Oh, that's better. Yes. <gasps> it's okay to be me. My name is Raquel, and when I think of equity in the arts, I think of seeing the stories of people of color. Let's watch. I see myself in that story. You see me, don't you? Oh, yes. All the flavors. My name is Emily. When I think of arts equity, I think of children having a place that's safe to be who they are. Let's watch. It's your home. Look in there, there's you. All our voices are heard. Thank you, actors. So part of the spontaneity and um, being quarantined is that I am doing a little makeshift with the singing bowl and a wooden spoon, which isn't normally what I would do, but I'm making do. A white Western canon is usually what people think of first when they hear the term arts. The dominant narrative of the Euro white experience literally dominates our center. Who essentially has the power to decide what they want to do is mostly white people. And is there someone who would care to tell a story that is inspired by this quote? Or a story that you, comes to mind because of this quote? Emily. So when I think about having the white Western canon uh, presented as the center in all of the most visible and culturally supported and, you know, in terms of what most of us see most of the time, um, I think about growing up in a small rural town in Massachusetts um, where I was, I think, one of three black children in my elementary school and maybe seven in my regional high school. And um, having parents who instilled in me enormous love in the love of the arts uh, theater and music and dance in particular and um, how I experienced my life in the theater and in the arts as being my refuge and, an, and a, an ecstatic reflection of my worth and my identity and only coming to realize when I went to college and moved to New York City um, at age 19 that all I had been steeped in was the white the white Western canon not knowing that there was anything that was missing um, and then having the opportunity to study and experience West African dance and culture and literature and travel to Senegal and learn to speak Wolof, um, you know, it was sort of a painful awakening and also so valuable in discovering parts of myself that I didn't know were there, but were also frightening and unfamiliar. Um, and there was also grief and shame with that. Um, and sadness that that my parents who were black and Jewish didn't um, 
didn't know that that my education and also my sense of myself had been limited by what uh, what I was shown. So we have three parts of this story. Um, growing up steeped in the white canon, thoroughly enjoying it, going off to college and discovering a whole other world that informed you about who you were. And then afterwards, being left with some questions. Does that sound right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we'll see this in, as a three-part story. Let's watch. This is my theater. I love my theater. And this is what I see. And I love my theater. Oh, wow. Warlof, these sounds, these flavors, this culture, the dance, this is, this is filling my soul. I found myself. But I, I lost another part of myself. I, but I found so much myself. But what does that mean about my younger self? Thank you, actors. Until we can actually directly address the issues that we're dealing with and name race and name the supremacy and name all the things, we're never gonna be, get there because our inability to talk about it actually reinforces the narrative that we're trying to dismantle. Yeah, Maria. Um, that quote resonates with me insofar as in my 20 or so years as a professional, um, navigating the world as a woman of color. Um, it wasn't until recently um, in my secondary career as a performer that I found myself being fired um, under the pretext of artistic differences uh, only to just discover and live on a daily basis misogyny and racism. So now I find myself in a position of trying to work with others on how to name the offense, uh, name the offender, offenders, if, if you will, um, so that this unfortunate incident doesn't just get swept under the rug, that it is named and that it becomes a platform to show not only Boston theater, but as far reaching as it, we can make it, that this behavior is not tolerated, should not be tolerated, and should no longer exist. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna see this story, which is, a lot of feelings as a rant. Maria's experience in the theater. Let's watch. You know, all this is going on, we gotta call it out. I can't just sit here and let people do this to me and never say anything. I've got to point a finger at it. I've got Are you to trying to make me crazy? Telling me this is what's happening when that's what's happening? 
you think I'm just going to fall for your lies? What, you, you're gaslighting me? You think I'm just going to give my authority over to you? No, I know what really. Why, why don't they see this? Why don't they see that this is racism and that this is the issue and this is white hegemony and this is a structural issue and nobody seems to you recognize can't the keep things. You have to bring it out to the, you know, what happens in the dark will come to the light. You can't just keep hiding it. We've got to admit I'm it. Surprised. I'm surprised we're coming together. I'm, I'm actually surprised. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not that surprised. We're coming together. We're coming together. I'm not that surprised. We're coming together. We're coming together. Thank you, actors. Spoke to your story. It did. Gaslighting was a word that came up often in the discussion, so that really hit me. Thank you. If you don't feel welcome in an art space, you probably won't go. If you feel like an outsider, why would you go if you don't see yourself represented in any way? If you don't have a personal connection, then why would you attend? Or if you even see yourself represented in a harmful way, or a stereotypical way, then why would you attend? Raquel. Yeah, um, hearing this story for me makes me think of my experience um, with theater. And I grew up in New Mexico, and so New Mexico is a state that's majority Latino, and I grew up in a city that was majority Latino in a school that was majority Latino. And during my childhood experience, most of the theater that my parents would take me to reflected the history of New Mexico and various Latino cultures as well as indigenous cultures. And for me, that's what I thought theater was until, um, and I really loved theater in that, and I was very involved in theater in high school. And then I went to college in Colorado, and I really struggled to find any sort of theater that I connected with or that I felt reflected my story in any way. And so I started to disconnect with theater. I stopped participating in theater. I stopped going to plays. Um, and it took a lot of time for me to reconnect with that, um, which some of that was through living in Latin America and getting connected to theater of the oppressed and connecting theater back to some of the activism work that I do. How did you feel when you were in Latin America and discovered those theaters that did represent you or allowed you to be represented? Yeah, I think I felt very excited. Um, and I think I was excited about both the potential for the use of theater in activism um, and particularly the use of theater to be able to tell people's stories um, and people's lives across contexts. Thank you. So we're going to see Raquel's changing relationship to theater as a fluid sculpture. Let's watch. Oh, wow. I see my experiences on that stage. Those people look like me. Oh, wow. I see my experiences on that stage. Hello? Where are you? Hello? Where are you? Mi cultura está siempre conmigo y es una puente. Mi cultura está siempre conmigo y es una puente. Oh, wow. Those people on the stage, those are my experiences. Those people look like me. Did you see your story, Raquel? I did. Hi, my name is Sonia, and I'm from the Mattapan, Dorchester, Roxbury area. Um, 
you know, in the last 10, 15 years, there have been a lot of shows. Um, they come to a major theater in Dorchester, and I, I kind of really thought that it would be a different kind of show. I, I was looking for theater that represented me. I kind of don't want to go to the same old stereotypical shuck and jive show that has been around forever. I want to see something, something fresh, something new, something that represents me because I don't fit into that stereotype. I don't belong in that box. And I want to see stuff out of the box. Would you say that you're a lover of theater, Sonia? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm a performer. I've been doing theater now for 13 years. And when I get the opportunity to go see it, when I have some free time, I'd really kind of just like to see something that I can really get into. Thank you. We're going to see this as a pair. And we're Maria and Emily. Um, what happens when theater comes to my neighborhood? Sonia's story. Let's watch. Ew. Oh, really? Here in my community, this old stuff? Ugh. Oh, racism here inside my community? <sighs> I live for theater. I've got a chance to see a play. This is going to be great. This is going to speak to me. This is going to be great. It's going to speak to me. Ugh, this feels, this feels wrong. This is wrong. You're wrong. Ugh, I don't want to be. I don't want, I want more. Come on, can't we do better? Ugh. Oh, come on. This, I know, I know. This is 2020. I am going to see a human story. This is 2020. Can't we see something new? Did you see your story? Yes, thank you. We always remember that every story is made up of many voices and voices that we haven't heard or dramatized parts of our community. And this is especially relevant when we're talking about equity, that we want to remember all the voices that aren't heard. And so we're going to bring to life a few of the voices that didn't get to be shown in the stories. Let's watch. Oh yes, everybody come on in. Come down the aisles. Yeah, right up on the stage. Everybody's welcome here. I don't really think I want you telling the truth about this organization. I mean, I don't, I don't think we can change. Gracias, mamá y papá. Esto es para ti. Anya Ginti no se crió, no se en teatro, no se en voz. Shadu oje nos povu. Thank you, actors. And we are Red Sage Stories. <laughs> 